Well, we have just launched today the new series on all things relationships, real talk on relationships. But do not panic. I'm not just about to share with you dating stories, marriage stories, or even our honeymoon story, which is very, very dramatic, hilarious, and adventurous. If anyone wants to know about our honeymoon story, we'll save that for another day, won't we, babe? Because it should be written in a book. Things not to happen when you get married. Anyway, (laughs) this morning we're talking all things friends. Friends is not only an amazing TV series, but it's actually an essential part of your life. So the title of my message, if you're taking notes this morning, is The Power of Friendship. And I had a best friend growing up in England. Her name was Carenza, and we were friends from the age of three right up until grade eight when her family moved away. Up until that point, we were completely inseparable. But even though they moved away, it didn't matter. We saw each other every weekend. We stayed in contact. She was my bridesmaid. We're both married now with kids. And thank goodness for social media, we are still in contact. Friendship is a precious thing. It says in Genesis 2 verse 8, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. You and I are designed to be in connection with each other. You were designed to, with the need for friendship, connection, and relationship. Firstly, to be connected in relationship with your heavenly Father, with Jesus. And secondly, to be made in relationship with his people. When I was growing up, my um, parents are the most generous people you will ever meet. And they love family. And they made it a priority not only to build our family, but to build the church family. So we lived with a door open policy. So basically that meant that no matter what time of day or night, if someone needed us, our door was open. And every Sunday we would all gather at mum and dad's for my dad's famous roast dinners and guaranteed every single week, there were already 10 of us before any of us got married, but guaranteed every week as my mum and dad were laying out all the meat, the door would fling open, Linda, Stuart, two more for dinner. And dad... To this very day, I don't understand this. My dad will buy the same size chicken every week and just pray it would feed the mouths that needed feeding. You see, my parents had made a safe space for so many people and a space that they could call home. You and I were designed with a need to be in connection. Even Jesus had friends. He had many followers. He had 12 disciples, but then he had three really close friends. Peter, James, and John. And throughout the Bible, you'll see so many significant people that God knew that they needed someone. He gave Eve to Adam, Elizabeth to Mary, Aaron for Moses, Ruth for Naomi, and Jonathan for David. No one is exempt from needing a friend. And no one is exempt from being a good friend. Matthew 22, verse 37 in the Passion, it says this, Jesus answered him, Love the Lord God with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being, and with everything that is within you. This is the greatest and supreme commandment. And the second of this is like it in importance. You must love your friend in the same way you love yourself. Friendship is a gift to your life and is key in unlocking your future. I did some research this week, and one in four Australians still say they are currently lonely. And 55% of the population feels that they lack in companionship, friendship, and relationship. 55% of the population, that is massive. Loneliness is not the lack of people, but the lack of intimacy with people. You can be surrounded by people and still feel lost and lonely, isolated, and disconnected. I also came across another article that said the national, this is the national strategy to address loneliness and isolation. There's an actual national strategy to address this. The answer is the church. That is God's answer to loneliness in our, in our world. The answer is the church. It's you and I. We are the family of God. We are the answer. God's promise in Psalm 68, it said, God sets the lonely in families. That means that you and I are the light of the world. 
You and I get to be part of this family that transform lives. Never underestimate what you get to be part of. You and I are called to love God and to love his people. John 15, 15 verse 12. It says, my commandment is this. Love each other as I, as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master's business is. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you. My command, this is my command, love each other. You're called to simply love each other. When we arrived in Australia two and a half years ago, we got off the plane and came straight to our house and we'd been unpacking and me and Johnny are like machines when it comes to unpacking. We had lived for three months with no furniture, nothing, not even a fridge, a bed, nothing. So when we got, finally got our furniture back, we were determined that on night one that we would all sleep in our own beds, fully decorated, done on night one. So we were, we were doing this, but we needed a break. So Johnny took one of the kids out and he went to get frozen Cokes, which is something you don't get in England. And I fully hold my husband responsible for our unhealthy addiction to frozen slushies. It started on day one and almost every day for the last two and a half years, I've needed a slushie. I actually have, it's, it's not great. But, Johnny will ask for forgiveness later. But, Johnny was out with one of the kids and, and the other kid was with me and he said, Mom, this house is massive. Because what you've got to understand, houses in England are not like houses in Australia. Our whole house in England would have fitted in our kitchen over here. That's the difference. So our boy was looking around this kitchen and he said, Mom, this house is so huge, it's a party house. But we've got one problem. We've got no friends. We've left them all. So what are we going to do? He's like, Mom, what actually are we going to do? So I reminded him of a conversation that Johnny and I had with the kids before we moved over here. And we sat them down. And in our transition time with our children, we said, hey, guys, there are, there are boys and girls in a school in Australia that need a friend like you. There are families in Australia that need a family like ours to come alongside them and simply be their friends. That's why God's calling us to Australia, to go and be friends with people that need someone like us. And he was quite happy with that. He ran off and, and um, looked at his bedroom. But then I said to him, dude, it's only Monday. I bet by Saturday we'll have friends that we can invite around for pizza. And while he was, uh, while he was away, I prayed on that God fill this house. And if you could do it by Saturday, I'd be super grateful. And um, the first Saturday we were here, six days later, an incredible couple that Johnny has stayed with in an Airbnb, they came over and they brought pizza. And they stayed and hung out with us. And they had no idea that they were an answer to a prayer. No idea. You and I are the answer to prayer. Friendship is a gift. Jesus had many followers and he shared experiences with them. He had incredible times with his 12 disciples, but he had a different level of friendship with Peter, James, and John. With those three, he shared personal moments with, and they saw him in his most painful time. They were his closest friends. They were his safe people. We all need people that we can experience things with and have fun with. We all need intimate friends that we can share and do life with. And we all need safe people. Even Jesus had it. Jesus understood the power of friendship and the power of doing life together. If Jesus, the Son of God, needed great friends, then so do you and I. So how do we do this? How do we develop good, life-giving, and healthy friendships? Number one, we be intentional and deliberate. We be intentional and deliberate. You need to make a decision to step towards relationship. What does that look like? Simply inviting someone over. 
It could mean anyone who's sat in the parents' room right now feeding their baby. It could be you asking the person sat next to you, hey, shall we go for a walk in the park this week? It could be simply accepting an invitation. Someone's been asking you to come over for months and months. Your step into a relationship could simply be you saying yes. Great friendships require us to invest into them. They do not just happen. There's a cost, John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one life, one's life for his friends. Actively pursuing friendship requires us to position ourselves where you can build. And after we got married, we moved over to Liverpool to start and help um, a brand new location. And at that point, I had a six-month-old baby with lung disease. I had a husband that worked away. We were the youth pastors. And the only th way I could describe it is I fell into a pit of loneliness. And remember, loneliness is not the lack of people. It's a lack of intimacy with people. I was surrounded by people all of the time, but yet I was lonely. And I had cried out to God, just one. I just need one friend. Just one, God. I don't need loads. Just one friend, one mom that I can do this journey with. And I prayed for months and months and months. And one morning, I heard a removal van on our street, and, and the baby loved looking out the windows. So I put the baby on the windowsill, and we were looking and watching this new family unload into their new house. And the Holy Spirit whispered into my heart, be the friend that you desire to have. And my response wasn't brilliant. I was furious. I was like, are you kidding me? God, I have prayed and prayed. I am the one that needs a friend. It is not fair. I do not want to be that for someone else. I have asked you to provide it for me. Do not deny that I'm the only person that has tantrums with Jesus. Like, you've all done it. Some more than others. Um, and once again, the Holy Spirit whispered gently into my spirit, be the friend that you desire to have. And then what I realized is I'd got completely stuck. My insecurity had become my security. I was so consumed with my lack that I couldn't see that I actually was the answer to someone else's prayer. So after saying to God, I am so sorry for that tantrum, but God, I'm not great with new people. I am super shy. I don't know how to do this. If I'm going to do this, God, you're going to have to help me. So I picked up my baby and I walked across the street. And I was absolutely terrified, actually freaking out. And I walked over to this young girl and said, Hi, I'm Nick. This is Alfie. Um, I'm going to the shop. Do you need anything? And you never guess what? She actually pulled out a list, right? She, and I was like, oh, my gosh. And I was like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, call Johnny. Babe, you know that budget we had this week? I'm spending it on someone else. And I walked and got her shopping. And actually, that became the start of an incredible friendship. Because every day I said to her, listen, my baby's not that well. So I can't go to mums and toddler groups. But what I do do is 11 o'clock every day, I go for a walk. Do you want to come with me? And that friendship grew and grew, and their family came into church and got touched by Jesus. Why? Because I made a decision to be intentional and deliberate and step towards friendship. Investing into friendship is a deliberate and intentional decision that you have to make. You are the answer to somebody's prayer. Who in your world needs you to be intentional and deliberate about stepping towards them today? So number one, is be intentional and deliberate. Number two is make it a priority. Life has a tendency to get super busy, doesn't it? Sometimes, especially on my days off, I have this plan. This is what I'm going to do. This is what it's going to look like. Does it ever look like that? No, because the kids will randomly get homework. A meeting won't be needed urgently. And just stuff happens. And I get to bed that night and I'm like, I have been so busy. But I haven't been busy with a purpose. I've not prioritized people at all. Good intentions without direction will always just be good ideas. Jesus prioritized people. Luke 19, verse 1 to 6. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. 
So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached that spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. The scripture says Jesus was passing through. But on his way, he looked up and he saw Zacchaeus. Who in your world needs you to see them? Jesus told him to come down because he was coming over to his house. Zacchaeus, his response was he came straight down. And he didn't just open his home, but he also opened his heart. Zacchaeus could have had a different response. He could have said, do you know what, Jesus? I've not done the bathrooms for a week. I've not managed to get to calls. Can you give me an hour? He could have had that response, but he didn't. Was it convenient? Was it expected? Did Jesus have the time? Did Jesus have to shift his plans? We don't know. But what we do know is Jesus saw Zacchaeus and he prioritized time with him and that then transformed his life. There are people in this room, there are people online, in your workplace, in play cafe, in school, in university that need the love and friendship that you carry. There are sons and daughters of this house that need to be nurtured by the mothers and daughters in this room. There are grandparents in this place that need to sit with our young adults and love on them and speak life over them. There are families that need to scoop up our youth and include them in their household. That's the power of walking hand in hand across the generations. That power will release and empower people to step into being who God's called them to be. That's the power of the community. It's the power of the house of God. Friends that will walk through life with you. Friends that will walk the tough stuff with you and then celebrate with the good stuff. Friends that will make memories with you and stand and believe with you, declaring the goodness of God over you. Friends that you can laugh your head off until you cry. And friends that you can break down and cry with. That's the power of of life-giving friendships. So number one, be intentional and deliberate. Number two, make it a priority. And number three, forgive always by extending grace. Having friends and being connected into a relationship is key and it's an essential part of your life. But it doesn't mean building them's ever easy. People are people. And there's not one person in this room that hasn't made a mistake when it comes to friendships and relationships. We've all been hurt, been disappointed as a result of a friendship or a relationship. But this is what Corinthians 2 verse 12 says. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Building great friendships and relationships requires us to forgive each other. Colossians 3 Bear with one another and forgive one another. For if any of you have any grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We are called to forgive quickly and extend grace freely. And that's not always easy. I had a season in my life where they were some of my closest friends at the time. And I found out that they had been talking about me in in not a great way. And this had been going on for months and months and months. And I found out. And I was absolutely devastated. And they apologized, and I said, yeah, all good, all good, we're friends, it's it's all good. I wasn't just devastated, I was absolutely heartbroken. My heart was shattered. And what I did is I decided that I would never allow anyone else to do that to me. So I decided that I was, I've got my husband, I've got my babies, I don't need anybody else. And we've all said those things, haven't we? That we're like, nope, no one will ever treat me like that again. And what I did is I completely withdrew from friendship. And I just invested into my husband and my babies. And I had surface level friendships with everyone. Those, those friendships, hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. How's your week? Yeah, kids sleeping? No, they never sleep. Is it? Oh, 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 good. One of those conversations that is just surface. No matter how many times people come alongside me and say, hey, are you okay? Yeah, fine. Are you okay? I just didn't do it. I didn't allow myself to be in that situation that anyone could betray my trust again. Until. 
I came to church one day, and in the middle of worship, my heart started to stir. And the pastor got up that day, and he started talking about unforgiveness. And the Holy Spirit touched my heart, and I'd realized that although I said it was fine, and I forgive them, I'd actually not forgiven them. And I'd held unforgiveness in my heart. And that unforgiveness had caused me to retreat and withdraw from any form of friendship and relationship. You see, the friends that did this, they were having the best time. They were, they were still hanging out, doing all sorts together. The only person that was hurting was me. I had a gaping hole in my heart that friendship should have been in. And because I couldn't forgive them, it was me that was missing out. So on that day, I said, God, I need you to help me. I want to forgive them. So I made a decision that every single morning, I would get out of bed and go in the bathroom and stare at myself in the mirror. And I would say, Father, I choose to forgive them. And that's a great idea when I was in church. I was like, yeah, I can do that. Until the next day, when I got up, and I positioned myself in front of the mirror. And I couldn't do it. And I realized that I'd held this so tight that it was robbing my joy. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Through gritted teeth, I said, Father, I forgive them. And then I said I was going to pray for them. Father, I forgive them and let them have a great day. Yeah, amen. It was the hardest prayer I have ever prayed in my entire life. Day two, out of bed, front of the mirror. Father, forgive them. I choose to forgive them and pray they have a great day and stuff. Day three, day four, day five, because I was determined that if God has spoken to me about it, I need to move some stuff. I was determined that I was not going to have that hole in my heart where community and family and friendship should be any longer. Week one, week two, week three, and by week four, I was able to stand there and say, Father, I forgive them. And I could pray blessing over them. God, I pray that every place their foot touches, God, you will bless and anoint and free them. God brought freedom into my life. And then I had to go again. And my little boy just started school and I start, started chatting to his teacher. And she said, oh, yeah, my husband works away too. He's in the army. So we realized is that I'm on my own all week. She was on her own all week. We've got kids the same age. Hey, Shall we do something together? We became best friends. We journeyed through really tough stuff together. We celebrated incredible stuff together. We're still so close to this very day. If I did not made a decision to accept forgiveness and release these people I was holding captive in my heart, I would have missed out on this incredible friendship and actually, my friend and I, um, her whole business now, she's got a whole business that is dedicated to building community. And Jesus has anointed it, and it's exploding. Why? Because we are called and designed to be needing connection with each other. That's the power of connection. 